Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Danica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Danica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room. Uh, today, um, if you've been following our podcast, you know that I feel very strongly about gun violence and that I consider it a public health emergency, literally thousands of times worse than the measles outbreak which we're all obsessed about justifiably. So today we're gonna to talk with Dr. Megan Ranning, an ER physician on the front lines who also happens to have a master's degree in public health. We're in the midst of a series and we've been covering this from various perspectives that easily get overlooked in the mainstream media because they're justifiably focused on the mass shootings du jour. We happen to be taping this on the 121st day of 2019. And already there have been 122 mass shootings in the United States this year alone. Now, last week, um, many of you listened to my episode with Dr. Jacqueline Schildkraut. And if you haven't, please do. She's a criminologist and an expert researcher in mass shootings who also wrote the recent book on Columbine, 20 Years Later and Beyond. She also personally suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD as a result of her secondary exposure to this subject. Since taping that interview only eight days ago, there have been another 12 mass shootings. Now, if that's not bad enough, overall there were nearly 40,000 gun deaths in 2017, which is the most recent data that we have, which was increased by 1,000 from the year before. Think about that. Nearly 40,000 families lost somebody to gun violence just in 2017 alone. And those are just the people who died. I don't even have accurate data on how many people survived being shot and who lived on to have horrific physical and emotional and psychological problems. We have every reason to suspect that this number will be even higher in 2018, in 2019, unless we take some action. Nearly two thirds were suicides, and we've discussed this from the perspective of suicide in a previous episode of our podcast with Dr. Laura Marshall, who opened up about her previous two suicide attempts and her tremendous gratitude that she did not have access to a gun during her most vulnerable moments. So back to our guest today, Dr. Megan Ranney. She's an associate professor of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Rhode Island Hospital, Albert School, uh, Medical School of Brown University. She is the director and founder of the Brown uh, Emergency Digital Health Innovation Project, as well as director, director of special projects in the Department of Emergency Medicine. She has an additional appointment in the Department of Health Services Policy and Practices at the Brown School of Public Health. Uh, so we're really glad she had time to meet with us today. <laughs> Her career focus is on developing, testing, and disseminating, disseminating digital health interventions to reduce the risk of violence and related mental health problems. She's currently a principal investigator or co-investigator on six federally funded grants and has over 100 peer review publications. She's an active mentor, teacher, undergrads, graduate students, medical students, residents, and junior faculty. And somehow she also finds time to be active on social media, including Twitter, where I uh, encountered her for the first time. She has a strong national leadership presence, including currently serving as an elected member at large on the board of directors of the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, an editor for the Annals of Emergency Medicine, uh, and chairing regional and national committees. Uh, including her governor's working group on gun safety. Now, most interestingly to me, she's also the founder and chief research officer of Affirm, which we're gonna hear more about, a coalition of leading United States medical associations working to curb the tide of indifference to and normalization of gun violence uh, in America through research. She's received numerous awards for her work and is a graduate of Harvard University, Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, and subsequently completed all of her postgraduate research training, fellowship, and MPH at Brown University. And she's also the mother of two young children. Welcome to the ladies' room. Thank you. It is such an honor to be here. I was worried about using up all of our time on your amazing bio and background. Um, but just to give people a color commentary of who you are as a woman, 
Uh, can you just share with us the most unique, interesting, or different ex memorable experience you ever had in a ladies' room, aside from this interview? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, let's see. Probably um, the most unique, interesting, or different experience I've ever had in or a ladies' room. Oh, probably, honestly, the most memorable was taking my little daughter to the ladies' room and having her ask what the person next to us was doing. <laughs> Back when she was still a little thing, going, honey, this is private, right? It's, uh, it's always entertaining. Um, and I certainly have many great memories of running to the ladies' room with my girlfriends over the years to, to dish gossip or to get advice um, on something before heading back to the dinner table or back out to the bar. So it's a, it's, an, it's a delight to be here and to get to have this chance to have this conversation in the same kind of intimate environment um, where we can share stories and, and tips and tricks and, and try to create change. So one of the reasons I always ask that question is it highlights what we have in common as humans. We all use the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> Much to my daughter's shock, yes. And we all have, you know, this, you know, human element of biological functions that we share. Of course, as mothers, we have this whole other you know, unique set of shared experiences, regardless of what our backgrounds are. How do you think your role as a mother uh, influences your work in gun violence in particular um, and your research and your advocacy? Yeah, I, I always say it influences it every day. I mean, it's really the reason that I do this work is on behalf of my kids and everyone else's kids. Um, becoming a mom changed me in ways that I never ever would have predicted. Um, but putting my kids on that school bus every morning or just sending them out into the world to little league or art class or theater, you know, as a parent, you can't control what happens to them when they're outside the doors of your own house and both my clinical stories, but also of course the news, um, has changed the way that, uh, I perceive gun violence, but being a mom, most of all has, has changed the way that I perceive it and, and has increased my conviction conviction that we got to do something for my kids, but also for everybody else's. Yeah, for me, that really struck home uh, when I, just a few weeks after I gave birth to my son, uh, I was driving by uh, a McDonald's and this was in the day, I had to make a phone call and this was in the days before cell phones. Right. So I pulled into the McDonald's to use a pay phone. And while I was literally on the phone, there was a young man who was about 22 who collapsed and was rapidly turning cyanotic. And my first re reaction was, oh shit, I do not have time for this. <laughs> my second reaction instantaneously was, this is somebody's baby. You yeah. know, this is somebody's boy. And yeah. I had just given birth to a boy. And of course, you know, went in and you know, evaluated him and he turned out he had food lodged in his throat and I did all the things I need to do. Oof. I did not have to do CPR, but I did have to Heimlich this 200 pound oh my gosh <laughs> when i was four weeks postpartum from a c-section that was a little challenging um but have you had to have any conversations with your children yet about oh. the news and about gun yeah, violence yeah. and gun shootings so so i share the story i mean one of the things there's so many things that you know so i have right now my kids are seven and ten um my 10 year old, uh, despite my best efforts, is totally aware of what's going on in the news, right? Um, and so she and I have actually started having conversations, the New Zealand shooting she heard of. And so we had to talk about it and what had happened. Um, but more affecting to me was actually a few years back, um, my little guy was still in preschool. So he was like three or four years old. Um, and there was a thunderstorm and uh, we were home. It was like a Saturday and we were all home you know, big thunderstorm, real loud thunder. And he goes and curls up in a little ball under um, our coffee table. It's a glass coffee table um, with his blanket. I sticks his thumb in his mouth. And I look at him and I'm like, buddy, what are you, I've never seen you do this before. What are you doing? And he's like, well, mom, at school, they tell me that if there are loud, scary noises, I should do turtle time under the desk. Oh, so, my God. Right. And I'm like, you're like three years old, dude. Like you're learning this in preschool to go do quote unquote turtle time if there are loud, scary noises. Mm -hmm. and, and you've just accepted this as part of your life, right? And then my kids come home from elementary school and they're like, oh, we did a lockdown drill today. <laughs> you know, we, we used to, as kids, um, you know, 
we, we would do fire drills, right? There was the bomb shelters, but, but to do a lockdown drill and to have that be part of your daily existence as a kid to think about what is it that you're going to do? Um, if, yeah, if I'm a child of the happen. 1960s, so we right? didn't have regular air raid drills where we had to go in the basement, uh, you know, and the air raid sirens uh, would go off and that was in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs, um, you know, disaster. Yeah. Um, but I have had situations, both of my children are older, they're graduates of college already, uh, yeah. but both of my children were in active shooter situations in college, on college mm. campuses. Um, and that was absolutely horrifically oh, I can't imagine. stressful and devastating. Um, and, you know, that's like a whole just another level of abject fear. Well, that's exactly as a parent. So it's one of, one of, you know, I could tell stories like a thousand cases, right, that I've taken care of, like, like any uh, emergency. And we want to hear some of those. I, and I, I will, but, but as the parent thing, and this is the thing where this gets me, and I think that being a parent influences my commitment to this topic, but I'm going to share one story, which is the story of someone that we work closely with at Affirm Research, um, which is the story of Tamara O'Neill, who's an emergency physician um, who was murdered mm. as she was walking out of work um, last November of 2018. Uh, by her uh, ex-fiance. He shot her and then shot a police officer and a pharmacist. Um, and through our work at a firm, we actually connected with her dad and um, some of her closest friends. And one of the things her dad said that has most stuck with me, um, and that now that I've paid attention to it, I hear kind of over and over again when we talk about these shootings, whether they're mass shootings or domestic violence or suicides, but it's this, he said is, you know, I spent my whole life trying to protect my kid and to do everything I could to give her every opportunity. And then in a second, the thing that I never thought to watch out for took her away from me, yeah. you know? And, and I think that, that that deep fear is there for every one of us. A lot of the, you know, you talk about measles. Okay, fine, I've gotten my kid vaccinated, right? Thank God my kids are healthy and I'm able to get them vaccinated. Or you talk about car crashes. It's like, well, I put my kids in car seats. And in fact, my, my seven-year-old is like, mom, I'm big enough to be out of a booster. And I'm like, no, you're not, buddy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, just, just wait. That is another topic of abject. Oh, birth. God. When they, when they start driving. The yeah, 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 right? When People, they start driving and forget to text you when they're home. Oh, yeah, that's, you know, very, right? uh, very scary. But you put them through classes. You, like, talk to them. You don't let them drive at night at first. You talk to them about drunk driving. You do everything you can to keep them safe. And I think that's one of the things about gun violence is, that it feels so random. And, and one of the things that I spend a lot of time on is thinking about it, it's actually not as random as it feels. It's, you know, your talk last week with Jacqueline, it sounds like you guys talked a lot about predictors. There's a lot of stuff that we can see ahead of time that can help us prevent this. But as a parent whose kid could potentially be caught in the crossfire, um, it, it, still, it, it still feels random and is just such a, um, it should be such a never event. And the fact that we even have to think about it when we send our kids on those school buses or the fact that my kids come home talking about the lockdown drills or that your kids went through that active shooter situation. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. It's just every parent's worst nightmare. It, it, it's every, every person's real first worst nightmare. So yeah. obviously there are a million things we have to do politically and as far as advocacy, but I, what I really want you to talk about today are your personal experiences as an ER physician of mm. what happens when somebody comes to the emergency room. You know, we hear a lot about the nearly 40,000 people who die per year of mm -hmm. gun wounds, and that is absolutely important. We don't really hear about the agony that people go through who don't die. Right. The numbers of those people. Now, many of us also, I know you don't have time to watch things on television like Grey's Anatomy mm -hmm. and these, you know, other doctor emergency room shows. Right. And it's a good thing. Um, I do it kind of as research. Uh, that's my excuse. I mostly want to hear what's <laughs> happening to them. But, I love it. <laughs> but what we see on television in shows like Grey's Anatomy are, you know, the patients come in, the doctors are waiting outside the emergency room for the ambulance. They immediately get the patients into surgery. And in a one hour episode with time out for commercials, the patient either dies right away, despite, you know, everybody's best efforts or they're miraculously cured and they're going home and mm. they're reunited with their loved one, you know, by the end of the episode. Now, in reality, that's not what happens. Tell right. us what in reality happens when a gunshot victim comes to your emergency room. 
Absolutely. And then, and I'll share that. And then I do want to come back to kind of that point that you made about advocacy, because I think there's some important stuff there too, story-wise. But um, so, so when a patient gets shot, right, or shoots themselves, and you mentioned two thirds of gun deaths are suicides. You know, the first thing is that EMS comes. And so our pre-hospital providers have to go to the scene and have to make sure that they're safe. Uh, before they approach the patient and then do their best to stop the bleeding right there in the scene and decide if the patient has signs of life and if they can even bring them to me. And so, you know, I think for a lot of us, suicide is a silent epidemic because we don't see it because the people that shoot themselves in a suicide attempt never make it to our doors. Um, but so, okay, say that EMS decides it's, it's something that they, the person's alive and they try to bring them to us, they do their best. We get a call ahead of time. I work at um, the hospital where I spend most of my time is a level one trauma center. We have a great relationship with our pre-hospital providers. Um, they call us ahead of time and give us a heads up that they're coming in if they can. Um, and we get the whole team together. So we have, you know, we practice. All of us as physicians, we went through ALS and BLS. And for those of us that practice in emergency departments or trauma um, centers, we do ATLS as well. So we have this whole team that comes together to put these protocols in place. So our respiratory therapist and our social worker and our nurses and uh, we've got a nurse on an IV and a nurse on meds and a nurse on the blood bank and um, the trauma surgeons and the emergency physicians. And, and we all unite and kind of get ready and gown up. And then the patient comes in and you do your assessment. And there's this standard kind of really protocolized trauma assessment that we go through where we have to put our emotions aside. And I've had people say, well, what does it feel like? I'm like, man, in the moment, I can't allow myself to feel. I have to concentrate on figuring out what's bleeding and how to stop it. And then depending on what we find in that you know, first primary survey and then in the secondary survey, then we make decisions about next steps. And one of the really horrible things about gunshot wounds is even leaving aside the suicides, the case fatality rate is so high. Um, depending on where you work, it's somewhere around 20 to 40% of patients that make it to the ER are gonna die before they leave the hospital, um, which we just don't experience with any other condition that comes into us. Um, and then there's the social work aspect of like, what do we tell the family? How do we, you know, who did this? Are we at risk here in the ER? We always think about when a gunshot wound comes in, like, are we at risk? Is someone going to come in? Is this going to be a revenge killing or something like that? And then for, we make the decision, do they go to the OR? So is it something that's serious enough that, that it has to be whisked off to the OR? And that's a wound in certain regions or certain vital signs. Um, or is it someone who maybe can even go home? So there's a percent of gunshot wounds that we just send home from the ER. If someone kind of nicks their skin or um, shoots themselves in, in the arm, but it doesn't hit any vessels, they can go straight home. And when we're concentrating on that initial resuscitation, again, we're thinking about saving the life. We're not thinking so much about the, the psychiatric aspects, the, the mental health aspects, what these people are going to have to live with after they walk out. Um, Okay, so I've talked about people that die before they come, the people that uh, kind of make it in and go home, um, and then there's all the rest. And, and so the vast majority of gunshot wounds do end up being admitted. Um, a percent go to the ER or go to the OR, a percent um, just stay on the floor. But for those who are shot very severely, for those who do go to the OR, it is, as you said, it's rarely what is portrayed in the TV, right? They're going to spend a minimum of days, but usually weeks or months. Um, in the hospital and then in rehab, and they're going to have their lives changed forever. I mean, and, and in, when we talk about rehab, many of these patients are going to go to inpatient rehab. Yeah. And then they're going to have, you know, weeks, months, years, a lifetime of outpatient. Absolutely, rehab. about patient physical therapy and just a total change in their life, you know, paralyzed, colostomy bag, um, uh, losing a limb. Um, uh, traumatic brain injury. I mean, the, I, the list can go on of, of all the ways in which people, people's lives get shattered forever, even if they do survive that initial injury. And that's just the physical injury. And that's just the physical. And then there's the mental. And then there's the, the ripple effect, the mental effects, not just on that patient, but on everyone around them, right? So many of us as providers talk about the quiet room, the room that we go to to tell the family that we've not been able to save their loved one. And the, you know, the, the utter, talk about as a parent, right, that being your worst fear, and, and those moments of telling parents that, that their kid has been shot or has shot themselves are some of the worst memories that I have. Um, 
And you talk about how you don't really have the luxury of dealing with your own emotions in the emergency situation. Correct. But afterwards, do you feel like you just need to collapse or vent or do you not have time because then you're on to the next case? Yeah. I mean, in the moment in the ED, you don't have time because you're on to the next case. Um, But we also don't as a profession get taught how to process it really ever. And one of the things that I think has been most affecting to me in my role as a national leader really in this area of changing the conversation around gun violence has been uh, the number of conversations that I've had with folks across the country, um, nurses, docs, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, social workers, um, who've never talked about their most affecting stories. And um, I have a few myself, you might too. Um, Almost every one of us does. Almost every one of us has a personal story of a friend or family member who's been affected. But we also have these clinical stories of like, these horrible cases, you know, the drive-by, the the 12-year-old who got shot in her kitchen because of a drive-by and we couldn't save her, or the young man who shot himself in the head with his father's gun and having to tell the dad. And as I do this work, I am starting to serve as a repository for those stories um, for my colleagues and friends and for people. It's... um, It's really this, this silent this silent epidemic that doesn't um, make it onto the front pages of the newspapers. Um, And that's the public health department. It's it's the anxiety, uh, the burden is infectious. It is. Uh, And I went into OBGYN Mm -hmm. uh, in large part because that's, you know, a hap, it's generally a happy specialty and generally we identify problems and we can generally fix them not always and certainly not in GYN oncology. Right. Uh, but in general, I never anticipated that in OBGYN residency, I would be caring for pregnant women who had been shot. Right. Um, and we even had one patient who I'm still haunted by, and this was in 1987, and I still am haunted by this woman because of what happened and because I don't know what happened afterwards. Mm. And I, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you about as an emergency room physician. You know, many times you don't get to find out what happened a month right. later or a year later. So we had a, a, a pregnant woman who came into the emergency room and we did an urgent delivery, uh, healthy baby, put the baby in her right. arms. We left the room and the baby's father came in and shot her seven times in the abdomen. Oh my God. Because he said the baby didn't look like him. Oh my God. And the good news is we were all there. You know, she was in the hospital when this happened. So we right. were able to take care of her right away. The good news was the baby wasn't shot, uh, even though she was holding the baby at the time. Oh my God. And the other good news is her uterus was still very large. So the uterus took most of the gunshot. Oh. All I know though, is that she survived surgery. And then right. she went you know, to the ICU and, and I don't know, I don't know whatever happened to her. Right. I don't know if that baby wound up having a mother. I don't know if the father was put in prison for X number of years. Right. I don't know what happened. And that, still haunts me when I think about this topic. Is there well, you're probably you think about? Yeah, I mean, as I was gonna say, you're probably haunted too by the questions of could you have done anything to have it not happen in the first place, right? Yeah, no, we're pretty confident that there was nothing. That, we, that, that I don't feel. Well, I'm not, not, not putting you at fault, like not saying that- No, like, no I mean, any of us. There was no way, because we didn't have, we had no idea he had a gun. Right. Well, so this is the interesting thing, right? And so this is what we're doing at a firm is trying to say, well, who is at risk and how do we stop this risk beforehand? And how do we educate folks so that, uh, you know, I I just gave a talk this morning to a bunch of um, EMS uh, pre-hospital providers. And and one of the things we talked about is the fact that part of it is us as a community um, knowing who's at risk. That if you're someone who's a gun owner and you know that your kid is feeling depressed, that you need to know to watch out for that kid and store, store your gun safely and maybe have it off site until you've gotten your kid help. With right? all and due so, respect, mm-hmm. if you're a gun owner, regardless of whether you have children who you know to be depressed, yes. the gun needs to be locked up appropriately. The ammunition needs to be stored 
separately. Absolutely. Um, because one of the things we know with suicide is we're very often in the situation where the person who killed themselves or attempted suicide, there was no evidence that right. they were depressed private previously or that they were at risk. So Absolutely. tell me the statistic, I don't want to get it wrong, about if you're a gun owner, if you have a gun in your home, anyone else who lives in your home is how many times more likely to attempt suicide or to die? So there, yes, there's a couple of different data, out, data points out there, but it's somewhere around five to eight times. And we know that kids who are suicidal, about 30% of them say that they can access a firearm easily. And um, the other statistic is that somebody in your home is 12 times more likely to got, die of a gunshot wound for any reason. So that would include accidental injuries. And that would also ironically include being shot outside the home and having nothing to do with your gun, but just by virtue of the fact that you feel you have to have a gun or you're in a, you travel in circles of people with guns. When I was a new mother, I read this article um, written by a woman whose toddler had been killed um, from an, just an accidental, you know, gun shooting at somebody else's house where the toddlers got a hold of the gun and they were, you know, playing and somebody got shot. Mm. And she said, it never occurred to me when my child was going on a play date. You know, we ask everything. Never occurred right. to me. Ask, do you have guns in your home? And so I actually started doing that just as a mom you know, when my kids were little. And I was staggered to find, and I'm not a gun, own, gun owner and I never have been a gun owner. And I do not permit guns in my home for under any circumstances, unless a police officer has to come because the alarm went off accidentally. Right. But I was staggered by how many friends and close acquaintances of mine had guns in the home. And then I would ask how they were secured. And mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many times other parents would say to me, oh, my children know they're not supposed to go in the gun drawer or they're right. not supposed to take the gun out. I was like, yeah, how about we have the play date at my house? <laughs> totally. And I think one of the really interesting things is knowing that actually the vast majority of gun owners are really safe, right? Mm -hmm. So there are about 330 million guns out there in the United States right now. About 30 to 40% of physicians are actually gun owners themselves. And I think it's important for us to not stigmatize gun ownership, but like you said, talk about how to make it safe and how to be aware of risk factors. But you're right, the safe storage is absolutely critical. Um, there's this neat talk that I gave with Tori McGowan um, at FIX uh, last fall. Um, she lives in Oregon, military doc, um, has a, more than one gun safe in her house. And, you know, talked about kind of the reality of being a rural doc who runs a farm mm -hmm. and how different it is for her versus for you or me, right? I live in an urban area. The police are a couple minutes away. There's absolutely no reason for me to need a gun. Um, in my house. Um, for her, it's a different calculus, but that uh, protecting the safety of her kids is critical. And you're right that those safer storage procedures are so essential. Um, and, and being aware of risks and then doing everything that you can to mitigate them. Um, but I think uh, that it's, it's really important for us to, to think about kind of what we can do. And then with the story of that horrible story that you shared around the guy that came and shot his, oh my God, the mom of his kid, you know, you wonder what warning signs were there before around domestic violence. And certainly one of my most affecting cases was um, a, a domestic violence case. So tell a us young woman that. who was shot by, by her partner and who we couldn't save. Um, so tell us about statistics about domestic violence. and oh, So, and yeah. So, so overall, uh, the vast majority of gun deaths in this country are guys, just like with every injury, right? There's something about testosterone that get, makes guys more likely to be injured. Um, but so about 86% of gun deaths are, are men. Um, but for women, those women who do die, almost, the vast majority of them are from domestic violence homicide. There's about 76 women per month uh, who are murdered uh, by a partner or former partner. Um, and we know that her partner having a gun is one of the biggest risk factors for her dying. You know, that uh, history of strangulation and just the moment of leaving are, are those things that really kind of put, you know, this as an OB-GYN that put our antennae up for, for risk. Um, and there are so many physician women who've been murdered by partners. You know, I shared the story of Tamara O'Neill, but we could go on. We could name the names of the dozens of physicians, not to mention our nursing colleagues um, who've been killed. Uh, so yeah, 76 women a month. It's, it's horrible, <laughs> horrible and so preventable. Um, 
So from an advocacy standpoint, tell us about uh, legislative efforts or failures and the boyfriend loophole. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the bills that is, has been shown to be really effective, right? Is decreasing access to firearms for people who have a history of domestic violence. And the federal law um, doesn't apply to boyfriends or partners. It applies so the to- The federal law is the Lautenberg law. Mm-hmm. The Lautenberg Amendment, yep. Former New Jersey and- Senator. And, and a number of- apply, It only applies to people who are married uh, or right. who are married to their partners. But also that law says that people who have a history of domestic violence can't have a job that requires a firearm. Yes, and it requires that they've been convicted of, a, of uh, that they've been convicted of domestic violence. So it doesn't apply to those folks that have restraining orders, right? Which we know is that moment of like super high risk. So a number of states are starting to pass laws that include, you know, especially in this day and age, right? That include folks who aren't married, so boyfriends or partners could apply to like same sex relationships, um, and and also can include um, misdemeanor charges or um, or that moment of the domestic violence domestic violence restraining order, um, really kind of around red flag laws as, as a, um, using those as a, to, to help protect um, the woman at, at that moment of high risk. Um, and that's been one of the policies that's been shown to have a great, um, very strong effect on decreasing domestic violence homicide. Um, the red flag laws are another policy that um, are, you know, there's some preliminary evidence that they're effective, particularly in decreasing suicide. But one of the really challenging things right now is that we just don't have evidence. Um, we, the RAND Institute, did a really nice review of the evidence behind policies a year or two ago. Um, and you can look at it on their website and you see that, you know, we in medicine, we practice based on standards of evidence. And the evidence behind a lot of the laws that are out there or that are being discussed simply is not high at this point. Um, and that's partly because we haven't been funding research. Exactly. It's so also partly about the active suppression mm. of CDC's ability to do gun violence research in the past? And has that even changed? Because I don't know, honestly. Yeah, so since 1996, there was this thing called the Dickey Amendment that was passed. Um, A junior representative from Arkansas named Jay Dickey uh, put this rider into a bill that said um, that no money could be used by the CDC to promote gun control. Now, the CDC can't do advocacy anyhow. So it's kind of a baloney um, amendment. But at the time that it was passed, basically Congress took all the money away from CDC that they'd been spending on um, firearm injury research. And uh, soon thereafter, money was also taken away from NIH. Since then, since 1996, there have been zero dollars spent by the CDC on firearm injury research. Um, and the NIH has spent less than 2% of what would be predicted based on the mortality burden. Like if you do like a regression graph looking at mortality versus funding, um, NIH has received, again, NIH has spent less than 2% of what would be predicted compared to other diseases with similar mortality burdens like right. sepsis. So what um, I, the way I like to explain it to people who don't study regression graphs. Totally. That when one person in the United States one single person passed Ebola onto one single other person. Mm-hmm. We had a national emergency response, full out, no holds barred, tons of money, tons of prophylaxis, tons of resources applied. Mm-hmm. And yet we have nearly 40,000 people a year, which is the same number, ironically as the number of women who die per year from breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And we have zero research uh, dollars from CDC applied to that and very minimal from NIH. That's a great analogy, Donica. And this is a public health emergency, in my opinion. So that's what I, and and when we talk about public health emergencies, we usually are talking about infections, right? So we're talking about things that one person is carrying and you may be innocently exposed to. How is that not an exact parallel to the massacre that we've seen or the drive-by shootings or the accidental shootings, uh, not to even mention the intentional shootings? Right. And I think the great thing about using that analogy too is that it highlights that policy alone is never enough, right? And I think that a lot of folks, when they talk about firearm injury, 
focus exclusively on the policy. And that's what we were talking about before and you were asking about advocacy. And it's really important for us as healthcare providers, you know, you started by asking about the quest the stories. And I think that it's really important for us to share the stories, but I also think for it's, it's important for us to think about all the ways that we can mitigate risk factors before a shooting happens, right? And so, you know, you think about, um, say car crashes or opioid overdose, right? So opioid overdoses are a great example where it's illegal to buy fentanyl, right? I, outside of kind of my, my, my cancer patients are kind of in the emergency department. It's certainly illegal to have it as a street drug, but that alone hasn't stopped um, the epidemic of opioid overdoses. That what's changing it is really good research, changing provider prescribing patterns, providing addiction treatment services, um, having the Loxone available, um, and that's starting to shift that epidemic. Same thing for HIV, right? We had research, we treated it as a public health emergency. But not soon enough. I mean, HIV is a very good example in that mm -hmm. respect because we were in deep denial. We were, right? it's a great, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And we also really stigmatized people who were afflicted. Uh, we were then in deep denial that women could even be infected. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in super deep denial that healthcare providers were at risk. Um, you know, we made jokes about it and you know, it wasn't funded. Um, right. I was actually in medical school at the time uh, HIV was named. I mean, it was oh. actually before that we were calling it HTLV3. We didn't even, right. it wasn't even called HIV yet. And grid, we right? It was gay related immune disorder for we weren't wearing gloves when we were drawing blood. Um, I was, I had to be tested for HIV for 10 years because I was in a clinical trial to test. Uh, I, I was first online to be one of the subjects in the first hepatitis B vaccine trial oh. because I was a third year medical student. And to me, the worst thing I could possibly get from a healthcare exposure was hepatitis B. Mm. So, so it, there's a lot of really interesting parallels if we look yeah. at it. But if we, if we look at the opioid epidemic, which is another public health emergency, mm -hmm. and just because one thing is a public health emergency, doesn't mean we can't have many different public exactly. health emergencies. But if we look at the opioid epidemic, and we look at all the initiatives we've taken that were completely misguided and don't do anything to prevent opioid deaths, all they're doing, many of these initiatives, particularly, you know, I can speak to what's going on in New Jersey, are just making it more difficult for chronic pain patients for sure. to get the meds they need because we're calling all of them opioids. So things like right. Tylenol with codeine is an opioid and it's a fairly benign drug that has a very low addictive potential. Um, or one of the best drugs that I love is a cough syrup that contains codeine. Codeine. Mm -hmm. Really severe bronchitis. I've never heard of anybody getting addicted to that. But now you have to go through all kinds of lengths to prescribe it. And well, I think that's time, actually, yeah, no, that's a really great example of that need for evidence, right? And, and the need for research is, and, and it's funny because I usually use the example of D.A.R.E., right? I'm sure that your kids yep. are, yep. The, um, I was very big in, explain what D.A.R.E. is for people who aren't old enough to remember. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're dating ourselves, right? But we aren't uh, young enough to remember because their kids weren't out of school by then. Yeah, so, so that's great. So D.A.R.E. is... Um, was a program to prevent substance use. So it was kind of teaching kids to just say no. It was all scare tactics. And it was shown to actually increase drug use. And I think that's a really great example of why when we approach this as a public health problem and we use research instead of kind of having, you know, a, a gut reaction of kind of what legislation should be passed or what education should be done that we really need the evidence so we don't make the problem worse, right? We don't want to um, create stigma. Like, you know, you think about that HIV epidemic um, and the way in which folks didn't even get tested because they were so afraid of the stigma associated with having HIV. And it wasn't until Rock Hudson and Ryan White came out and created private funding mechanisms to start to do research, to start to talk about how to change the epidemic. That was well, and one of the early Ash died of mm -hmm. HIV, which was documented from a blood transfusion. I think that really also had, you know, a very uh, pivotal moment. And of course, Magic Johnson. Yeah. Uh, coming out as living with HIV. But they, you know, Rock Hudson and, and Ryan White really created those early private funding mechanisms that started to shift the sense of it so that it wasn't this like stigmatized disease, but rather something we could apply the public health model to. And that then led to the federal funding, which has helped to transform the epidemic. 
Um, but but that early those early steps were really critical in our starting to approach it as a as a public health epidemic. So um, suppose we had a woman elected president who was really con con committed to gun uh, violence prevention and gun reform, and she appointed you as the gun violence czar. Mm. What would be your number one thing on your wish immediate to do list on your first day in in the job? So can I have three? No, I, wait, you can have three, but they have to be prioritized. Fair. I was actually so, going to give you 10, but you only ah, have three. So always ask for more than what you want. That's a great one. Uh, that, that, so first of all, that's a great question. We should be so lucky in every respect as to see this be a true prioritization of this as a public health epidemic. So the very first thing that I would do is I would task the CDC with a, treating this as a public health epidemic and task them with doing the work that they always do, which is bringing together different sides, listening to the perspectives, doing good research, putting good policies in place to help us stop this epidemic. The next thing that well, I would do is I would- Number one B, if you can't mm -hmm. just task them, you, you have also to get the money. Have to get appropriations. You have Absolutely. To, you have to fully fund that. Because many times Congress will pass legislation as an unfunded mandate. So the Lautenberg law, for example, was originally passed with no funding attached to it. Zero. So, okay. Next. It's so bonkers. Next. Yeah. No, but that's, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. You're totally, totally right. So then the next thing was, that's perfect. The next thing is actually to adequately fund enforcement of existing laws. We have a lot of laws out there that simply are not being enforced. So the Lautenberg Amendment you know, is one example. Certainly we should strengthen it. But even that alone, we have some preliminary evidence is not being adequately in enforced. You look at um, the Sutherland Springs shooter. So there was a, a shooting down in Texas last winter um, where a guy went and shot up a church full of people. He should never have passed a background check. Like the background checks that exist, he should not, he had every risk factor. And in fact, according to current federal law, he should never have been able to purchase that firearm. And so we need to enforce those laws that we need to provide the resources to enforce the laws that we do have. In my work, you mentioned I, you know, I, I am the chair of my governor's um, gun safety task force or working group um, along with a uh, state trooper. And one of the things that I hear from my law enforcement colleagues here is that they don't have the resources to, to do what they need to do. Um, so, so I think to me, that would be the second thing is to do a better job of um, enforcing the laws that we do have that we know work when you apply them appropriately. And you're talking about, obviously, if the president appointed you, you'd be talking about federal laws. Yes. But one of the other huge issues from you know, my more distanced perspective is that every state has different laws. And you could get a gun in one state and cross state lines and mm -hmm. you know, where the different background check rules, different laws apply. And um, my understanding is that's one of the big issues with Illinois. Yeah, it is, is that there's um, uh, certainly surrounded by states with um, less stringent laws. Um, but there's also, you know, there's the illegal transfer going on there too. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many. So there, there, there are so many things that could be done. But so those would be um, my first two steps. Um, and then the third one, uh, so, so adequately funding the CDC and allowing it to get good epidemiological data and create good guidance. Um, looking at the laws that we have currently federally and allowing them to be adequately enforced. Um, so beefing up the background check system um, so that they can actually complete background checks in the time period allowed. Um, and then the third thing would actually be working very closely um, with the vast majority, you know, I said before, but the vast majority of firearm owners across the country are responsible, right? And so working and they closely also, with them. They also, in every survey, the vast majority of gun owners Mm -hmm. one stringent gun background check laws. Exactly. And so my third thing would be creating a coalition. And this is what we're doing already within a firm, although certainly not within the realm of being like the SAR or whoever the next president is, but, but creating a coalition where we can create um, change. You know, I, I talk about, uh, I would never presume to talk about changing motorcycle crashes without having people who ride motorcycles involved right? You look at the Netherlands and the way that way they've decreased bike crashes um, by having bike riders intimately involved with the design of their streets, the way that they do bike sharing, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be my third step is really creating that coalition so that we can put common sense measures in place that are, that we can actually put in place 
because when we do it as an us versus them, as like one side versus the other, you're gonna get half the country that's gonna be resisting that and not on board. And so my third step would be creating that coalition so that we can actually create real and lasting change. So that this isn't something that's at the whims of one political administration or another, one presidential administration or another, but rather something that we can all get behind and move forwards on with this as a health issue. And so expanding the coalitions that we're already creating, that um, we're working on at Affirm Research, that uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is creating with the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Those are ways that we can truly today help prevent these events that should be never events and treat this as a health epidemic, which is truly what it is. Yeah. Um, it is no different from any other type of injury or disease. As you said, it's infectious. Well, and one of the one of the things that I very often talk about in diseases that there's not uh, a great public desire to treat or mm -hmm. take care of is I usually talk about how much money we're spending and losing on those mm -hmm. conditions. And then I've got people's attention who have no other reason to pay attention. But I didn't even look up the statistics on how many billions of dollars this costs us as a society. Do you happen to know that number? So the stats are really, so there are statistics that are kind of all over the map um, from a few billion to hundreds of billions. It really depends on, and part of the trouble is, is that we just don't have great data because the CDC is not adequately funded to track it. Um, and it also really depends on how you say, you know, do we count all lost lives? Do we count all rehab? Do we count the fact you're not working? Um, but it's certainly in the hundreds um, in the billions of dollars um, on a national scale each year. And I'm um, still at the point in my life where even $1 billion is a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> for sure. A so million dollars is a lot of money. Hundreds of billions. You know, that should really get people's attention. Um, now, I didn't tell people in the intro what a firm stands for. So can you tell us the acronym, what it stands for? Yep, so it stands for the American Foundation for Firearm Injury Reduction in Medicine. Uh, it's affirmresearch.org. Uh, and what it really is, is a group of healthcare professionals. We have more than 20 medical societies, including ACOG, um, as well as- the uh, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Mm -hmm. Nurses, um, psychologists, uh, public health professionals, um, who've joined together to say this is a public health problem and then we can solve it using the public health approach. Um, we are working to change the conversation through things like this podcast um, to, to really change it from, uh, again, an us versus them to, to a health approach and then to create and push out solutions quickly. We so can't has every member organization of your coalition issued a statement or press release mm -hmm. saying that gun violence is a public health, public health problem? Yes, they have. And they're all working together to help support research and to help create protocols for their specialties so that we can have best practices. We have med students involved, right? None of us got educated in med school about how to screen. And you'd asked me before, and we got off on a tangent, like all good ladies. That's what happens in the ladies' room. We get off on all <laughs> kinds of tangents. Exactly. Come back. <laughs> but you'd asked, you'd asked about the long-term effects, right? We don't know about the long-term effects. We don't know how to, like there's so much out there that we don't know, but we're working to try to answer that and then to create ways to prevent it. Um, I think that's my number one thing on my wish list that mm. I try to tell people. Yeah, what's yours? Is, yeah. Well, not in what I would do if I was in that job. Um, and I would never be put in that job because I have way too much of a temper. But, <laughs> but the number one thing I want people to to know and to realize about any initiatives towards the goal of eliminating uh, or reducing gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, many people say, well, that can't be done because that won't accommodate this situation, this situation, and this situation. So because one rule or one law exactly. doesn't handle everything, like background checks, for example, or, you know, I, and, and if I were in the job that I offered to you, um, if, you know, President Elizabeth Warren or President Kamala Harris appointed me to that job, number one on my list would be an assault weapons ban. Um, there is just no reason, in my very humble opinion, for any civilian to have an assault weapon. You can't tell me that's for sport or for hunting. Mm. Uh, that is a weapon that is designed for mass destruction. 
So given that, and that's just my number one thing, I wouldn't even go to number two. That would just be my focus. So given that, please tell people, what is the difference? You, you talked about some people who have gunshot wounds are grazed and you know they really can even be discharged after first aid kind of medical care. What's the difference between somebody getting shot with a handgun and grazed and somebody getting shot with an assault weapon? So I'm actually, I am going to push back a little bit here because um, I think it's actually really important to recognize. So um, most, a lot of handguns that are out there are actually semi-automatic as well. So there are a lot of, and I'm not like being semantics here, but the vast majority of deaths in this country are handguns, not AR-15s or so-called assault rifles. I think that focusing on assault rifles is a way to have us not make any forward progress because that is an area where there is such deep political divide that it stops us from making progress on the huge number of injuries and deaths that happen every day across the country and that are almost all by handguns. But now, we had an assault weapons ban until 2000 and what? So there was the Brady Bill, right, which limited certain types of uh, weapons from being sold or in production. Um, but it didn't stop, right? So I hear you, like you don't- But when that stop. law was not renewed, mm -hmm. our gun violence deaths soared. Our gun violence deaths have soared for a whole lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. So as I said, that's why I would never be put in that kind of position. <laughs> right, so anyways, I think should, yes. So taking that aside, there is a difference, right? So when you get shot by different types of guns, there is a difference in the type of wound and the velocity, the caliber, right? And the number of gunshots that you sustain. Well, and um, the number of people who survive your okay. pre-field, your field uh, triage system. Exactly. Make it to the emergency room. Absolutely. And, and you're right that the vast majority of mass shootings in this country have been with AR-15s or similar um, uh, types of firearms. And that those that happen with something that has, you know, you look at Las Vegas, which had the bump stock, those that happen with weapons that have the capability of shooting a lot of rounds really quickly have much higher fatality rates because people don't have time to escape. And so there is absolutely a role for decreasing access to those firearms to people who are high risk. Um, they shouldn't have access to any firearms, right? But certainly not ones that can inflict maximum damage in a minimum amount of time. So and that's the point that we, we got away from uh, that mm -hmm. I wanted you to come back to, which is, you know, tell us who is at high risk. Great. So, so people who are at high risk. So the first group is people who are suicidal or depressed. And as you said, a lot of people who commit suicide, there's no warning sign ahead of time, but certainly those who just- So Robin Williams was a great example. Yeah. You know, everybody was sh shocked, except his <laughs> wife. I was going to say, I think the people from, from what I read, the people that were close to him certainly knew that he'd struggled for years um, with what sounds like it was bipolar disorder, right? And, and well, had he, had, had, he um, actually had an um, autopsy and it was his wife later revealed he knew that he had a rare form of uh, early pre-onset dementia and he just mm -hmm. didn't want to live with that. I think he had Louis body's, Louis's body dementia. Wow. So he also had a pre-existing long history with depression, which interestingly, many comedians do, even mm -hmm. though their public persona is joy and happiness and trying to make other people happy, they're really suffering inside. So yeah. back to the risk factors. But yeah, so well, and so that's actually a great lead into a second risk factor, which is dementia. Um, so we know that early stages of dementia, people are more likely to commit suicide. And in the late stages of dementia, right, there's that risk of paranoia and assuming, um, uh, delusions. And so that's another area where people are at high risk. And so folks with either an early or a late stage um, dementia should be talked to about um, firearm access and their family members. The same way that we talk about, you know, at what point should you stop driving? Mm -hmm. We should be having the same discussions about firearm access. Um, another group is domestic violence. We already talked about that. You had your case. I have mine. 76 women die a month. Um, women who've been victims of domestic violence. It's an area where um, there is zero um, debate um, that that folks who are committing domestic violence should not have access to firearms and that it's something to me that just heightens my concern about that woman and increases the importance of safety planning and getting her into a really safe space 
if you're in a state with red flag laws, um, that's a time to consider, you know, most of us, most states healthcare providers can't activate those, um, but it's a time to involve law enforcement. All right, so tell people what red flag laws are and why they are, are not easily accessed. Mm -hmm. So red flag laws are, uh, and I actually don't have the most recent statistic, I think it's in about 13 or 16 states right now. Um, they're also known as extreme risk protection orders. Um, they've come about, um, uh, actually, one of the first ones was in Connecticut long before Sandy Hook, and then in Indiana after a mass shooting, where um, folks had risk factors, had signs, um, and there was nothing that anyone could do um, to, to decrease that person's access to a firearm. So the, the young man in the Parkland shooter. The oh. Parkland shooter is another great example, absolutely, where he had risk factors, um, showed over and over again that he was high risk of doing something really bad, and yet had access to firearms, right? And there was no legal way to, to limit that at that point. So red flag laws say someone's in a moment of crisis, right? It's a way to temporarily, not permanently, but temporarily remove firearms from their house um, until they get help and, and get better. And then it gets reconsidered and different states have different versions of it. So even if they're not the gun owner. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the Parkland shooter, he was living with some kind of foster parent situation. Right, right. The gun, gun owners. So it really depends on the state on how exactly it works. So different states have, despite the fact that um, there are a couple of kind of example laws, each state has a little bit different version. So in some states, it is only if they're the gun owner. In some states, it's just if they live in a household. Um, in some states, only law enforcement can activate it. In some states, family members can. In some states, healthcare professionals can. But the idea behind them is that if you are taking, if you are, um, aware of someone who's high risk, that there's some sort of method um, to temporarily remove the firearm from them so that they cannot hurt themselves or others. And interestingly, the best evidence so far shows that where red flag laws have been most effective has been around suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. States with red flag laws have shown um, significant decreases in, in rates of gun, gun suicide. So this um, is an interesting point. Mm -hmm. uh, that I want everybody who's listening to think about in their own lives. And here's something, you know, what I always try to do for our listeners and ask our guests is, you know, what can people listening do? Right. I love that. This is something you could do in your own life voluntarily, even if you're in a place that doesn't have a red flag law. As far as I know, any person for any reason can take their guns to a police station and say, I need these out of my house for either forever or mm -hmm. temporarily or for X reason. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are concerned that somebody in your household uh, may have access to your firearms and they should not, get them out of the house or again, make sure they are locked up in a way that that person does not have access to. Access. Yeah, so I, I think- a town shooter, he, his mother had an arsenal in mm -hmm. her house, um, but, the young man was able to get access uh, to that, those guns yeah. and shoot his mother first. So, you know, that's something again, that parents really have to be the first line of defense. Yeah. And, and I think I love your point. So kind of police, um, a police station, um, a biometric safe. So for a parent, like um, some of the most upsetting stories I've heard have been ones where kids knew how to get into their parents gun safe. Um, when you where the key was, and if it's a biometric safe, so with a fingerprint, then your kid can't get in. The other option is storing it at a range. Um, mm -hmm. So for a lot of parents or, or gun owners, you, they belong to ranges. And so for those folks, that can be another option. Yeah, I heard um, a great comment from a friend of mine who is a bowler. And she says, I don't bring my bowling shoes home. <laughs> I, keep, I get my bowling shoes at the bowling alley. She I love says, it. Why don't people who are hunting for sport just leave their guns locked up at the gun range. Yeah, if they do belong to a gun range, I think that that's a great option. Um, and I think, you know, you're talking, you, you mentioned about Adam Lynn, about the Newtown shooter. I don't want to Yeah, we don't him. mention any names of any shooters. Yeah. I, I appreciate, I love that. Uh, so interestingly, he was in an ER a couple weeks before, and the shooter at the Navy Yard was in an ER a couple weeks before. And the shooter at Parkland was certainly well involved with the medical system. And again, I think it highlights the opportunity for us. Can we, you know, going back to your point, can we stop every occurrence? No, but can we decrease them? Absolutely. Imagine if we had talked to that mom of that Sandy Hook shooter about all the reasons, you know, that she had brought him in and all the things that, um, all the risks 
and had talked to her seriously and honestly about decreasing her son's firearm access. So I love that point of yours about what can your listeners take away. And it really is about being thoughtful about, um, about risk and, and also, um, you know, being thoughtful about, about their, about their family members, um, and, and their loved ones. And, and particularly with the new town shooter, one of the things I always like to interject when we talk about that situation is he had two parents. You know, we're always talking about the mother's role and complicity in that situation. But I, one of the things that used to outrage me for the first couple of years after Newtown, and now I'm just mm-hmm. sim- a simmering rage, now it's not a broiling rage, is that at no point was there any discussion of the father's role in this. Yeah. Who was totally not living true. in the home, you know, who had moved, uh, but he still was the father. And he still, you know, had a role and certainly was probably aware of his son. That's a great point. Situation. Mm -hmm. Um, So back to something else you mentioned um, about how physicians in the medical community can uh, have a role in this. There was this very interesting conversation on Twitter about how every medical specialty has become involved in directly affected by gun violence in some way. Mm-hmm. You know, and I shared about you know, my patient, my OB patient, who was shot in the hospital. And I never in a million years thought as an OBGYN, I would have anything to do with you know, gunshot wounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's important for us to, you know, I, I'm also still seething about the NRA issuing that statement about physicians having to stay in our lane. Totally. And I think that one sentence did more to activate the medical community than anything else. But if you think about it, every single medical specialty started yeah. with OBGYN, uh, identifying domestic violence uh, victims or people at risk, pediatrics, I, uh, talking to their patients, yeah. uh, to the parents of their patients about how they store guns, and all the way through emergency room physicians, psychiatrists, uh, even dermatologists, yeah. uh, radiologists, pathologists, you know, epidemiologists, any specialty we can think about. So what I would challenge all of our medical uh, personnel who are listening to think about is what is your lane? Mm. How we can't, none of us can solve or, or address all of these problems until somebody appoints you as the gun czar uh, or as the gun violence prevention czar. There you go. Uh, we'll come up with a better term for it. Uh, we'll, I love we'll, it. We'll finesse that. But in, no. the, meantime, in the meantime, I, I love that. Think about what their sandbox is. Mm. And how in your sandbox, uh, whether your sandbox is a little tiny sandbox or whether your sandbox is, you know, a whole beach along the Atlantic Ocean, uh, what can you personally do? And so if I was a random physician anywhere and I said to you, Dr. Rani, what can I do in my sandbox? Step one, what can I do? So again, I have three things that I think every physician or other healthcare professional across the country can do. So the first thing is to talk to those high-risk patients and to do it in a non-judgmental, non-stigmatizing way. Know that if you come at them and say, you got to get rid of your gun, right? You're going to scare them off. They're going to run away. It's never going to change. So to to think about kind of having that cultural competence. So first is those high-risk patients, domestic violence, suicide, dementia, kids who have an assault injury, kids in general, right? Um, to think about having discussions with those patients in a thoughtful and empathetic way. The second thing is to join coalitions. And I urge people to go and take a look at affirmresearch.org to join us in this quest to change the American response to this epidemic to one that's based on it being a public health epidemic. We don't need to wait for government. We don't need to wait for that theoretical day when I or someone else get to be um, up in the, you know, working with, with the president. And we can start now and we are doing it already. And we can, we can start making a difference and start bending the curve on this epidemic. And then the third thing, as you said, is to share your stories, to make it so that everyone across the country is aware of the public health implications of this epidemic, both the immediate injury, but also its long-term consequences for us and for the victims and for their families. And if we all commit to doing those three things, we can solve this. Well, and before you gave me one thing. <laughs> I think the other thing that we all have to remember, regardless of what our medical connection is, or if we have no medical connection, if we're over 18 and we're United States citizens, we're still voters. Yes, thank you. That's 
first and foremost before everything else that we bring to the table. Mm. And uh, you know, I think we have to start voting as people who are concerned about this issue. So I could talk to you all day long about this. Same. Um, this has been such a pleasure. I think you've really brought up so many provocative points and given people a lot to think about. Um, and maybe we'll have you come back again, you know, at some point uh, when we're closer to the and talk about more specific advocacy issues. But in the meantime, where can people go for more information? So in the meantime, they can go to www.affirm, A-F-F-I-R-M, research.org or to your individual medical specialty society page. As you mentioned, almost every medical society has um, some sort of guidance here. Well, I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Be safe and keep doing the great, great work that you are uh, to advance this issue. I appreciate it. And I know everybody who listened really appreciated it. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. I'm going to go now get ready for my, uh, for my shift in the ER this evening. So <laughs> well, hopefully you. you won't have any gunshot wounds today. Oh. Well, chances are I will, but thank you. I'll keep working. Thank you. Take care. Good luck. Be thank safe. You. Thank you. You too. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.